Good morning and welcome to Coffee with the Sarlows. I'm Kelly. Good morning, I'm Karen. We're going to start off with show notes today as usual. We have our evening with medium events coming up on April 24th, August 28th, and December 4th this year. Tickets are on sale at the website by sarlow.com so you can grab those before they're gone. We have a second podcast series called Sips of Sanity. Those are 10 to 15 minute podcast shows. There's a series of five that airs the first week of each month, Monday to Friday. The very first show of each series is on our website by sarlo.com and it's free. The remaining four are found at patreon.com backslash by Sarlo. And you can also find an access to Patreon on our website by Sarlo.com to get you there. Good. It's a nice orangish button that doesn't match anything on our website. That's so true. you shouldn't have trouble finding it. <laughs> yes, it, it really stands out. And that whole series of shows is to help you um, create a toolkit or an awareness to grow your ability to handle problems better by creating emotional and spiritual intelligence tools. Good. Okay. Uh, Then we also have personal sessions and gift certificates available. Sessions are done anywhere in the world via Skype, FaceTime, telephone, Zoom, and now WhatsApp and Google Hangouts if need be. Sorry, I had a brain fart. Um, And we're adding more of those options onto the website soon. Uh, So really, you can reach us anywhere in the world. I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who's tuning into our show, whether you're listening by audio today solely or whether you're finding us in a visual format. Kelly and I have been working really hard to bring both to you and we appreciate however you're finding us. And you're finding us all over the world. It's super fun for us to hear all of these different countries that are tuning into the show, meaning that people everywhere are wanting to learn and to grow. So thank you. Um, I'd like to read a thank you this morning that did come in from someone in Toronto, Canada, and his name is Richard. So Richard, here's what you wrote to us. I so understood how messed up life gets when someone is always lying to you and then tells you, I love you. Thank you for giving us stories to relate to. I've read books on this, but was not able to relate to them. The shows have helped me to see myself in each story. Thank you for the tools to understand my drama. Richard, you're welcome. (laughs) Cool. It, it's it's what we're it's what Kelly and I are hoping for in the whole purpose of doing this. Nice. Now on to today's show. So, this one is about um, moms. These are moms that have had sessions with us um, who have empathic children and don't really know what to do to support them. So it's a culmination, actually, of me trying to pull together what's occurred in sessions and what's occurred when you and I have had conversations around what parents are going through. So I wanted to begin this first by talking about empathy for the people that are listening to this and going, okay, that's cool, but what is it? Mm -hmm. So to me, being empathic is something that every human has the capability of doing unless you've been diagnosed by someone in a in the medical profession like psychology where you are a psychopath mm-hmm. right because they lack empathy is that correct oh absolutely but there are extreme spectrum disorders that yeah. also lack empathy and it's not it's definitely not psychopath right um i just want to be mindful of that thank you mm-hmm. so this comes with people who do have a level of empathy. Now, anyone listening to this, I think, can listen to today's show and get something out of it. We're talking about children particularly today because parents are looking for a way to say, how do I keep the empathy going in my child? And I want to talk about empathy in the sense of that this means that you care. This means that you can connect to another person. You can relate to what they're feeling or what they're thinking or what they may be going through. I, I, can I slide something in here as well? Because um, some of the questions that have come to me about this topic are also um, kind of in tandem with another question, which is how do I maintain my child's intuitiveness? And 
empathy actually is the key. So I think for some people, when we come back to respond to them about maintaining their intuition in their child, they can be frustrated going, I didn't ask about empathy. I asked how to keep their gifts. Empathy is the key to keeping intuition going. That's right. So this is, if you want to consider it, your foundation. And that's the purpose of wanting to do the show. Mm -hmm. So it builds. We're trying to give people, as you said, the foundation so that the gifts can build. Now, I had an interesting conversation with a lady yesterday where the guide said to her, gifts, everyone has these abilities. So if you're each born with them, then do we actually just continue to grow them and nurture them through life and keep using them? Or is it possible that if we're born with these abilities, which we call gifts, is it that we shut them down for a number of reasons? So I'm going to add that to the conversation. We can come back and forth into it today if it presents itself. Okay, so I've tried to be organized for everybody and actually have about... 19 different points. Holy moly. Okay. So for the people, because we know some of our listeners have pen and paper when yeah. we do the shows, or <laughs> I just realized I said pen and paper. Can I correct tablets? that to tablets? <laughs> okay. However they're doing it. But I understand that some of them are going to go, oh, this is so good. I'm going to open up an Excel spreadsheet and I'm going to put it into a chart form. I'll hit the pause button. Yes. And don't be frustrated when they overlap. Yes. Because many of the points will overlap. We just try and break them up so that we can give you more and more. Oh, and, and I totally know that there are going to be listeners that by the end of this show, this is going to air on the Saturday, and they're going to probably send us their chart by email, maybe Sunday night or Monday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's fantastic. We absolutely love when people do stuff like that and then give us permission to share it if they want to mm -hmm. on the Patreon platform. So if that's of interest to people and they want to help out, that's cool. Super fun too, because this show is actually airing, I believe, in and around the March break. Oh, um, time good. here in Canada anyway. I'm not, I'm sure that's not true of um, other, other countries. Yeah. Or actually, maybe even not provinces. I'm not too sure. Um, but if you've got some extra time coming up with your kids or time to reflect on uh, the time you've just spent together, then this will be a great show. Yeah. Now, I, I want to add a couple of cute little things in here, too. I did call one of my best friends who is a retired principal. Mm -hmm. And I uh, have spoken to different people about what they what they perceive empathy to be and how they see a lack of it in the school system. Mm -hmm. And I'll say in the school system, meaning not the teachers. I'm talking about the kids and their families. I'd have said both. We can but say yes. both. But I, I do want to be specific. Like, I do want to address the fact that if you have no empathy in the home, if you have parents that are all about themselves and then their children show up to school and have no empathy, that the teachers have to understand or could understand that it's not being taught innately in the home. It's not, there's no role model. And that's one of the, one of the points in here is being the role model mm -hmm. for that. So for that ability, for that in, intrinsic characteristic trait that we are all supposed to have. So if it's not modeled, it's actually something that we lose. You don't give away the goods here. Okay, but I want to bring up that I hope teachers are going to listen to this today to understand why students don't have it mm -hmm. and how big of a role model they can be as teachers or principals and how important it is in their, in their jobs to be those for the students. Yeah, and you can cultivate it even when it's yes. lost. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, number okay, one. Number one. So I am going to look at the sheet. Mm -hmm. You know, usually we don't quite have a sheet, but I'm going to do that today. because our table's so skinny, it blocks the other person's frame. Okay. It's an I... editing nightmare, but go ahead. Okay. We'll use the master. So I'm actually named this show, How to Support, Encourage, Develop, Main, and Maintain Empathy. Okay. Okay. I know that's you the You named the show, did you? 
Well, just in this context, Kelly. Okay. okay. So the very first point is the one that I just said. Mm. You have to show it in yourself and you have to actually live it. Be the best example of being empathic even when someone makes fun of you. Isn't that cool? Okay. I want anyone who's hitting like their panic attack button just to hit the pause button instead and remember that you can come back, write down this point, key it into your tablet, whatever you're doing, and you can come back to this point once we've actually gone through how to cultivate empathy. Because I think, yes, it's a great point that you first and foremost have to show it in yourself, but some people are listening because they've lost it. Right. So hang on, stay with us. You can always come back to this point once you know what to do with empathy. Mm. And how, maybe how to recreate it in your own self. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I literally just had a quick call with um, a coaching client who needed help um, figuring out what she wants to feel in a day. So going through core desired feelings. And she goes, well, I, I know what I want to feel, but now I'm stuck with how. How do I do it? Mm. And, and this is the problem, right? Right. Is the, the big question of how. Okay. That we're trying to answer. Okay. So I'm say, I want to go back to a little point in here about being the example of it, meaning that when you are trying to be empathic yourself, that you are allowing yourself to feel something, that you are not people-pleasing, that you're just feeling whatever it is truthfully. And I think some people have a very difficult time with that for fear of being judged. And I mean by themselves. I don't just mean by other people. Mm-hmm. They judge themselves harshly. Okay. I, I, that's a good point to start with. So maybe it, it is also good to um, uh, break down that right now you're talking about just being able to feel your own emotions. We're not yet talking about extending empathy to another person, but right. just for yourself. Yeah. Because some people will sit here and go, well, empathy is about empathizing with someone else, but first and foremost, as you're saying, you have to empathize with your own emotions. You have to feel your own emotions. Yes. If we're going to put it super yep. simply, mm-hmm. you have to be able to to value that you have your own. And when we are codependent or enmeshed with others, we often skip that step. Mm-hmm. We just want to know what the other person feels and then be on the same page as them so as we don't create conflict. Right. And the problem in that is that if you don't ever actually experience your own emotions, then you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes. You yes. can't see where they're coming from because you don't actually even know what the emotion is. Yeah, And and so you really are, as I'll use your favorite word, you are in a clusterfuck mm-hmm. of, of confusion waiting for someone else to cue you on what you th- should think and feel. And that's codependence. Not empathy. Correct. Good. So people who are codependent can believe that they have extremely high levels of empathy. They believe that. Oh, I know. But that's where we're saying that's the clusterfuck moment Mm -hmm. because it actually is not accurate. Good. You have to become aware of your own feelings. And I know we've repeated that. Some people are going to go, come on, girls, move on. Yeah, but some people don't get it till the fourth point. That's right. And for people who are in that position... Yes, they need to keep hearing this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Yeah, and I think too, you know, um, thank you to the listeners who have been here since day one or since show 50. Um, But for the people who are just turning in today, you're hearing the term people pleaser for the first time. Mm -hmm. And you're not understanding what we mean by you can't people please if you're going to have empathy. You've got a lot of homework to do first. Yes. So our regular listeners have to be empathetic to the first timers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. There's a good clusterfuck. Well, it is because when you when you pick a topic like this, there's going to be people all at these different levels of one to ten, mm-hmm. right? Or left and right side of the pendulum swing, however you want to look at it. So in and a person listening might think they're highly empathic, and yet they may shut it down and not be. Mm-hmm. Or they may think they are narcissistically and aren't at all. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to keep all of these different types of audiences in mind as we've done as we're doing this show. Mm-hmm. It's complicated. Yeah, it's interesting. I want to illustrate this too because some people will be like, "Well, well, how do people pleasers show empathy different than 
narcissists and people pleasers are just in the confusion of, I'm just going to mirror what you're showing me I think I should feel. Yeah. Narcissists realize that the attention is taken off of them. And so they've got to amp up their emotional um, display or their... Um, performance, I'll say, yeah. um, to show that they're as, as sad as you are and as bothered as you are, and they think that's empathy. Right. And really, it's it's a performance. Oh, I like that. You're distinguishing the performance for, from the authenticity. Yes. And if we don't realize it's a performance, then we can stay attached to them thinking, I love them. Mm-hmm. But if we realize it's a performance, then we can come out and go, who do I love again? If this is just a performance? Yeah, and also, I mean, not even just your your partner. It can be a, f- a friend who amps things up so that the attention stays on them or equally on them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I have to be careful with 19 points. I don't get too tangential here. <laughs> Back to you. Okay. Um, discuss it in front of your children. Give them a vocabulary around empathy. Make uncomfortable feelings okay to feel and not something you avoid. Did you just go from two to three? No. Oh, okay. So we're in, oh, still in point two. That was all in point yeah, two. I want to be very careful because I okay. think some people are going to sit at the end of this and go, 19, I wrote 36. And I that's okay. Oh, that's yeah. great. Perfect. If you can break it up even further... Yes. And give yourself more manageable steps on how to navigate empath- um, being empathic, then that's that's great. Right. And I, I well imagine that there will be multiple types of charts, even mm-hmm. within some areas. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So give them the vocabulary. Oh, no. First of all, let's talk about discuss it in front of them. Let's break this one down. So be comfortable. Be okay. Make this normal to talk about being empathic. Teach them the word. Mm-hmm. Don't think it's not a good word for a five-year-old. You have to teach them cookie. You have to teach them TV, television, or computer. I mean, with computers in the digital age, we're teaching our kids tremendous amounts of vocabulary at a young age. Mm -hmm. Don't shy away from the word empathic Mm -hmm. or empathy. Or or, feel. Or feel Mm -hmm. or emotions. And, And I think there are some people that think, oh, they'll never understand that. Well, maybe that's because you don't. You don't know how to describe it. <laughs> Did I say something? I think that's hilarious. <laughs> maybe it's tough because you don't get it. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. You know what? This is really smart. Um, and I'm glad that you brought this up because I just saw this article on Facebook where this um, speech pathologist has like um, a word board. And she literally just trained her dog to talk in full sentences just by choosing a, like a full sentence structure with these buttons. Oh, my God. So if you think it's difficult to teach your kid empathy, <laughs> what do you think about this woman and her dog? Okay. This is such a good example. Thank you. So, again, I'm just trying to reiterate, don't think that they can't understand it. Give them the words to describe their feelings. You can say angry, but you could also say, instead of anger, you could say frustrated, disappointed, sad, grieving, Missing someone, loss, um, jealousy, envy. Now, we're we're talking about the forms of anger, Mm -hmm. but it's actually teaching someone to be able to identify their emotions more specifically. Yeah, you have to be able to discern the, the differences. Yes, because if you are going to continue to feel empathy for others, then it's better if you can just say, geez, I'm picking up on your anger. But instead... I'm picking up on your frustration. How about embarrassment? Yes. How many people say they're angry because they're embarrassed? I've been. Mm-hmm. I totally get that. So imagine if you or someone is empathic towards me and understands or thinks that I'm just angry. Well, they might just be like, well, I don't give a shit then. They might be mad that I'm angry but or not know what to do with it or think, oh, she's just in her ego. Mm-hmm. Right? A lot of people are tossing out that word these days. She's just in her ego. Instead of being a truly empathic and going, oh, she's afraid or she's embarrassed, that's different. Now when we feel the, that empathically that, oh, they're embarrassed, 
No, we can be empathic and think, oh, I can understand being embarrassed. I've been embarrassed before because we're relating. We can put ourselves in their position. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I know what that's like to be embarrassed. Um, If I just give her some privacy, she'll be okay. I can offer that because now it gives us choices, which comes into some of the later ones. But it's still important to say that if you are able to give the words and create vocabulary, then something can be dealt with differently. Mm -hmm. And you can use more accurately and connect with more accuracy to what the person is experiencing. Mm -hmm. And and I'll just say something that you said in lesser, you said it in an example and not in plain terms, is ask questions. Oh, and people, one of them. Oh, pardon me. Uh, and I just mean that in the sense that you can prompt them or cue them to mm-hmm. have good language by putting the language in your questions. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thank you for saying that mm. because you, you've added that it can go in the questions. Mm-hmm. Perfect. This point, number two, for those charting it, has to do with creating a vocabulary. So that's the key word. So you might, if you have a three-year-old, you might be teaching new words. Mm -hmm. If you have a five-year-old, you might think, oh, maybe now is the time to explain the difference between jealousy and envy. And if you don't know it, ask. Research. Research. We we know it. They can contact us and ask, ask us a question like that. So research so that you understand And give yourself the opportunity to connect to yourself Mm -hmm. and then be able to chat with your child. So if there's conflict going on between siblings or friend groups, then instead of just seeing that they're mad, you might want to find out if they're jealous or frustrated or envious and so on. And then you move through the other steps to teach empathy so that they can understand what another person feels. Or you point out to your child when they're in that moment, say they're really angry that their siblings are getting ice cream and they're not. They didn't get their bowl yet. Then you can use it as a teachable moment. And I don't mean with meanness. I don't mean that you withhold the ice cream on purpose, but you can create just a pause and a level of awareness for the child. And now, especially depending upon the age, you don't do that to a two-year-old. They may not get it at two, but they may get it at three. They may get it definitely at four or five. So you can have a teachable moment there um, just to draw attention to them about how they feel when they don't get what they want. So that if they're then turning around and doing that to their sibling, withholding something their sibling wants, then you go back and say, how did you feel when you didn't get the ice cream? When you didn't get something you wanted, what types of feelings did you have? So you might ask them in that moment, we go back to the moment when they don't get their ice cream, you have them identify how they feel. I feel angry. I feel left out. I feel sad, whatever it is that they feel. I am frustrated. You help them identify the feelings. So that 10 minutes later, if they're withholding a toy from their sibling, now you've got some vocabulary to be able to say, geez, do you think your brother feels sad, frustrated? The same way that you might have felt when you didn't get ice cream. So you want to be able to create the vocabulary in a, in a very teachable moment when it's applicable to them, and then use it as quickly as you can in the first situation that presents itself where you can use those words and tools to make it apply to have it connect to how someone else feels. That's empathy. Good? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So this is why we want to say, discuss it in front of them. Create the vocabulary and make sure that your family is using that. Because then when the teachers go to do it, they're not going to have as hard a time trying to say something to your child and have them understand. Mm -hmm. This is where sometimes parents go into the school system and the teachers are trying to explain their child's behavior 
and that they lack empathy for another child that they've bullied or they've been mean to or that they've excluded from the group, a variety of things, right? Mm-hmm. And the parent just wants the teacher to just solve it and, and make it end instead of understanding, oh, this is a teachable moment. Maybe what, like, what could I do at home to help the school system be able to solve this better with my child? Number three, explain how you have feelings and someone else is allowed to have their feelings. So here is where you might have the very same situation. Maybe you and your child haven't been given ice cream and your partner and maybe other children or the other guests um, have gotten theirs. And you might be able to say to them, what if they're upset about it, what do they feel about it? But you might also be able to say how you feel about the very same situation and that it's different than the way they feel. So we're in the same situation, but two people feel differently about the very same thing. Mm -hmm. I think this is important because if you are going to be someone who just wants to validate everything your kid feels, then they learn that they're entitled And I don't mean entitled to the ice cream. I mean entitled to have irrational or disproportionate reactions to situations. You're gold. Thanks. Yeah, if you can sit there, you know, age appropriate, of course, and and always, if you can sit there and say, well, yeah, okay, I acknowledge that you do feel upset. Um, I don't feel flustered. I know someone's in the kitchen and that our bowls are coming next. Right? So you give them that perspective. I feel patient. I feel excited that it's coming, right? Mm -hmm. So that they can frame the situation differently. And and in that, in that ice cream example, I can be excited for the person across the table from me who already has their ice cream because I know how much I'm looking forward to that moment. Yes. And you might even think, hmm, they're going to be done before me (laughs) and I might still enjoy it. And, and, and that says that I can have the patience to wait, that I can know that I will have my needs met too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one I'll say use very carefully age appropriately because you can really turn that into a not great situation if they cannot empathize and they hold over someone's head that they've got ice cream longer than another person does. Yeah, I don't mean these things I know you don't. in negative ways. And I'm trying to be careful not to go down that road today mm-hmm. um, for every example. I know, yeah. yeah. And, and I just, I think it's still important to mention because some parents will want to offer that. Like, well, we'll have ours long after they're done. And it oh, sounds like true. fun in the moment. And it sounds like a really good solution because you think, oh, they'll, they'll be happy. That'll make them patient. Mm. But then it becomes a moment afterwards if you actually haven't taught empathy. Mm-hmm. There's no empathy teaching in that. You're just trying to say, at some point, we're going to have more than them. Mm, that's not that's what I not mean. That's not the point. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And I think parents overlook that when they just want obedience or good behavior. Right. And, and okay, and I will leave that be. You've pointed out something well, and hopefully if people need to re-listen to what I've said, they can go back. Yeah, and in more situations so that we don't have to keep illustrating this, you can sit there and go, okay, am I actually teaching empathy or am I teaching that they'll have something more than another person later? Yeah, I don't mean more than or longer than. Thank you. Karen, people know you don't mean that. Uh, I know. I'm okay. trying to help the parents know how to train themselves. Okay. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. That mm-hmm. doesn't dawn on me, but I understand what you're saying. So people thanks. know you're intelligent. People know you're considerate. <laughs> people know that you're empathic. Right. We're trying to illustrate two different right. sides, not because you meant something. Yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. Thank you. Teach respect for someone else's feelings, which goes beautifully right with that one. So you teach that. So if you're out in public and somebody else is having a temper tantrum in the mall, you teach your child to be respectful that that child is in some sort of distress instead of just going, oh, I wish people would take their noisy kids home. Mm -hmm. That's not empathic. Empathy is, hey, if that child is screaming and is showing some distress, 
something needs, some need needs to be met. We don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what's important. We don't know what it is. So instead of judging it, we can just sit back and just let it go that that person has to have someone else take care of their needs. We can't maybe in the moment, but empathy means that you don't judge it negatively. Mm -hmm. It means that when you don't know something, you allow the fact that you don't know. But your empathy extends to, because I don't know and I don't judge, I can be open. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you see children of a certain age start to label things good and bad. And mm -hmm. and they label it almost in the form of a question, like checking in with mom and dad, like, right, mom? Right, dad? That, right. That's a bad kid, right, mom? Right. Because they're trying to gauge behaviors, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think about a kid witnessing another child, maybe of a, of a younger age, having a meltdown in Walmart. Walmart's the perfect place to have a meltdown for any age. <laughs> <laughs> But if, if your kid is at that stage where they're trying to discern what is good and bad behavior, and you're talking about not judging because we don't know what this person's situation is, yeah. then that is a teachable moment for empathy where you can say to them, well, it appears that this person just doesn't know how to express what their need is, right? We're not saying that their behavior is good because they, need an, uh, they have a need that needs to be met, and so they're vocalizing it. We're saying that, in fact, that person doesn't know how to express their need in a healthy way, right. which is what you're trying to teach your kid to do by giving them language, which was point two. I can think back to times when you guys were small, you and Andrew, and I might be out in public and you're not behaving well. Maybe you're crying. Well, maybe your brother. <laughs> I know everybody all get a kick out I of that. I had one. I had one meltdown. You did. You had one meltdown <laughs> in Walmart and you didn't have another one after that, actually. But what I'm saying is, is that I remember there being a meltdown, mm -hmm. a crying, uh, uh, like a full, almost screaming and so on. And I, and I didn't know what it was about. Mm -hmm. But because I had empathy, it was a situation of something is creating this. There is some reason and I need to know what the reason is instead of disciplining. Mm -hmm. Empathy means you go into what is causing this and find out. As a result of that, he ended up showing me that he had a rash all over mm. and that he was sweating and he was red and that he had, we had to go to emerge. Mm -hmm. it, and so once I realized and he, he was allowed to show me this, because I had a state of, or a feeling of empathy for him instead of he's behaving badly, he needs to be disciplined, he needs to be put in his place, I need to drag him out of here, whatever, whatever parents or whoever goes into, empathy means I want to know more. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. I trust that there's a reason for this. So there's a level of trust. I trust that there's something going on mm -hmm. and I want to find out what it is. Yeah. Then I will see what my choices are. Then I will see what action needs to be taken. But you go through a process. So when you actually have empathy, you have the ability to have more information and you have the ability to have more choices. Mm -hmm. When you don't have empathy, you get yourself into some poo-pooed situations mm -hmm. and you can end up being a, a, not a good parent. And I'm saying that judgmentally, meaning that I could have walked away and let Andrew sit in that rash, in that allergic reaction, and it could have gone on. It could have made him worse. His throat could have closed his, well, and so yeah. on and so on. So I'm trying to say to people, empathy is valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think not a good parent is just not a good parent. It's not necessarily a judgment. If you're taking your voice away from your kid, you're not doing a good job at parenting. The same way a boss can say, you did the report wrong, you did not do a good job. And it's not who you are, it's the behavior. Mm -hmm. I want to say too, like mix up a couple of these points. Don't use yeah. them in isolated events. That's the exact opposite of what we want. So if we're talking about mm -hmm. knowing more, and having that patience and trust, say to your child, can you use your words? Can we take a deep breath and, and use your words, right? Because we're talking about using the language that we've taught them. Mm -hmm. Yes. But they've got to know and trust that you're actually going to listen to them. Mm -hmm. I think this example applies to when people are also bullied. Mm -hmm. 
because we don't, they, there's a lack of using the words to explain it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to move on. Sure. Ask them to imagine being in another person's situation. And I wrote down with this one, act it out. As Can a- you, sorry. Can you tell me Karen's example or tell the listeners Karen's example that she told you over the phone with this one to put themselves in someone else's shoes? Oh, my girlfriend, the, the mm-hmm. principal. I don't remember. Do you? Yeah. Oh, she, tell it. I don't recall it. She was talking about two kids being in a play, like um, not a play yard, the schoolyard. And if one person punched the other kid in the nose, oh. that she would say to the person who did the punching, where do you think they felt that? Where in their body do you think is hurting right now? Because they actually have to go into a very specific mindset or a very specific visual to feel in their own body, well, if I punched him in the nose, then right here is where they must be hurting. Mm -hmm. And and it makes it personal, right? If I have to point to my own nose, I envision what that pain looks like. Right. Yes, that's exactly. Yes, she said that she would ask the students' questions to build empathy. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember, I don't think this was her example, but I'd like to continue it. I just don't want to say it's all hers in case I'm wrong. We can give her the credit. We can. Okay, sure. I think from that point in a schoolyard or a situation in your home where one person has punched the other, for example, I think it's important that you ask that type of question. Where did they, where do you think that would hurt in their body? How do you think that makes them feel that you hurt them and you're their friend or you're their schoolmate? Do you think they feel safe to come to school now? Do you think that they would feel safe if they see you in the schoolyard? If someone punched you in the face and you saw them the next day, would you be scared to come to school? Mm -hmm. Would you start to have a sick tummy at night because you don't want to go the next morning. Yeah, and I think this is this is great in terms of age, like appropriateness for age, is that when they are this young, you want to ask leading questions. You yeah. want to ask the yes or no's because they don't have the ability to see beyond the one question, right? Yes. Um, I mean, unless they're quite advanced. And then as they get older and older, the hypotheticals can be a little bit more vague um, and open-ended questions so that they can actually picture... All, all scenarios, all cases. I think, too, something that could be beneficial here, but I'm not a teacher or a principal, so I have no idea. Just an educated woman. Uh, well, I'm just going to throw this out there and see you know, what happens with it. I think it would be good, particularly at a very young age, for the child who's thrown the punch to be able to watch the student who's been punched. Say they have a bleeding nose, just as an example, um, or they're crying whatever it is, I think it would be good for that student who punched them in the nose to actually have to sit in the principal's office or the nurse, oh, I guess there's no more nurses' offices at schools, but in the principal's office or in the front foyer, whatever it is, with the student who's been punched. Mm -hmm. I think that as their nose is bleeding, they should have to sit there. I think that maybe they should be asked to go get the Kleenex. I think they might be asked to actually get a warm cloth with water on it and hand it to them so that they can actually care for their nose. I think then it would be a great opportunity for empathy to begin. I'll say with the supervision of an adult so that that punched kid feels safe. Certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. I would not say leave those two kids alone so that the bully can continue to punch them. No. But that's the same situation with a coworker who's bullied another person and the boss doesn't oversee anything. And that is exactly what happens. But if we go back to the children, because this is where we're trying to build it, maintain it, and create it, right? I think it's important for the person who's perpetuated the incident to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Or empathy ends. If they get to go back to class and now they're they're going to gym and it's their favorite subject <laughs> there's no they they don't feel any empathy mm-hmm. they didn't miss gym class their favorite class but if they sit in the hallway taking care of the person that they've hurt and they're missing something that's important to them they actually have to see consequences when you don't have empathy 
And th- I think that's a key thing. Because if we, if we put immigrants in prisons and in cages, and it, we don't stick around to see how they're treated each day, we don't stick around to see when they have a fever, how sick they are, and their needs are not being met, we don't have empathy. If we get to go back into our jobs, if we get to go back into our comfortable lives when we, where we are fed, then we don't have empathy. And that's how those situations go from a schoolyard to a bigger issue. You okay? Yeah, I think it's a really bad example in the sense that these people that you're saying that are putting people in cages do walk away, but then demand the, care, the facilitators of these places, so the ones that are guarding them, to also not have empathy. Yeah. They're, they're inflicting it on more people. It's, it's actually right. not just a one-on-one situation at that point. And I say bad example in the sense that it, might, it doesn't necessarily relate straight to parents parenting their kid. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to draw the parallel, I hope people are understanding, between that if we don't do that when they're small yeah. and it doesn't start and grow from that point, that that's how we become adults that can do those things okay. and not have any empathy in those situations, whether we're the one that's created that and built the jail or this or the cell. We work in it and mm-hmm. we keep the money for our job and we just turn a blind eye to it or we go off to work and we pay no attention when there's a str- when there's a protest about it or an email that comes in and says sign here and we walk away from every single incident mm-hmm. where we could have been part of a solution that i'm saying that this comes in our society in process mm-hmm. and for for people listening i'm trying to say that it's critical right from childhood to not end empathy. Yeah, because you're, you're essentially talking about a belief system that excludes empathy. So if the belief system is racism, if the belief system is that you are less than me fundamentally yes. because yes. of what you look like and what your genes are, then I don't have to extend any level of empathy to you because you're never equal to me. Right. And, and there, a great example for this can be how parents treat servers in restaurants in front of their children. Mm-hmm. So if they're ignorant and rude to them, if they lie to them, you know, I found a hair in my food, but they didn't. But it's a, a, it, it could be a way to say, well, I'm looking for a free meal here or a discount. I want something from this. Your language in front of your children and your behavior either disconnects them from empathy or, or builds it. Mm-hmm. And every little example. Mm -hmm. This one came from Karen, the next one. And it had to do with, as she suggested, or and what they do in schools to build empathy is to read books. It's to read stories. And she was pointing out to me in a conversation one day how another educator, and I can't remember if she knows them or doesn't know them, but was talking about that one of the reasons why society is moving away from being empathic is that people are not reading as much or they're reading factual things. The top five reasons, the top five vegetables never to eat, top five, and it's even pictures now. So she was saying in order to build empathy, we need to read stories where we are engaged And where we feel for what the person in the story is going through. Well, this goes back to, I think it's episode seven or eight, where we did um, a whole podcast on J.K. Rowling's book, um, Empathy and Imagination, or Imagination and Empathy, and the importance of imagination, because you have to actually imagine yourself in someone else's shoes in order to have empathy. Um, and, and that's what we do when we read and we enter different worlds. That's what we do when we start to want to relate to a character in a book. How many of us read books that are fictional and want to imagine ourselves as the main character or as the love interest or as the best friend? Well, I think that's why people followed Harry Potter. And I think of the, of the, of the I can't remember which show it was or which book it was, pardon me, book, which book it was where his te- the new teacher, the female, mm-hmm. um, was hurting him. 
Mm-hmm. Now I think of the people who might read that and laugh. Mm-hmm. And I think, okay, no empathy. And I think of the people that could read that and just move on and not care. Mm-hmm. No empathy. And then I think of the people who would read that and feel so angry that she did that to Harry mm-hmm. and could imagine it being done to themselves. Mm-hmm. That's empathy. And that's an opportunity to discuss that with your child. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the, this language of empathy itself is actually what we are trying to say as a society when we're talking about the danger of video games. Oh, yes. And we use the word violence. We, t- we emphasize the, um, the risk of exposing these kids to violence. But in fact, the actual problem is that it's exposing them to all kinds of situations that entirely lack empathy. That's right. If you are going to hold someone at gunpoint in their own car and tell them to get out of their car in these Grand Theft Auto games, then you have zero empathy. Right. For what the, for what this person is feeling, for the degree of fear or any emotion for that matter. And and I want to point out that some people think, oh, here we go with that debate. It's, but it's, but we're not debating violence. That's, that's right. I think that's a fucking no brainer. But the violence is not the point. It's before that, which is empathy. That's right. Thank you. Normalize empathy. Make people who aren't the ones who need to do some of the work. Say that again. Sorry. Maybe I didn't say it well. Maybe I didn't hear it well. Make people who aren't the ones who need to do the work instead of that you're the one that has to do the work because you have empathy. Make it their problem. Make them learn how to become empathic. So you, you normalize it instead of them normalizing that there's no empathy. Mm-hmm. Stay in your own healthy norm. Mm-hmm. And so, Can I give a quick example? Yeah, I was just going to. Oh, you do it then. Not laughing at a joke that isn't funny. Oh, thank you. When someone treats another person poorly and the crowd laughs, or the one or two people listening to the story laughs, it teaches the other person that you can laugh at someone's embarrassment or humiliation and that empathy is not present, nor is it valued. Okay. I was going to go into an example with that, but it, it makes me so mad every time I think about it. Okay. Then don't. I'm going to move on. Okay. <laughs> it's where my empathy was through the roof at a um, hockey game. No, but that would be a good example. Roller derby. You tend to give the same examples a few times, so I'm, no, I'm curious. This actually was with, um, oh, my uh, hypnotist. Oh, yes. When the hypnotist told the person that was under... <clears throat> hypnosis. That everything was on fire. Yep. And oh. she was... Distraught. Distraught, screaming yep. and crying for little... like 15 minutes, mm-hmm. trying to get all of us to leave the room and nobody would move. And I just remembered sitting there looking at the hypnotist thinking, you're an asshole. You couldn't pick something funny? I'd like, I, yeah. yeah. And, and everybody's supposed to laugh at her distress? What the... F- like that was... That was so unhealthy. Mm. I thought that hypnotist needed to like find well, it's an, another unethical. Co- yeah, it was totally unethical. Mm. You can find so many other examples for people to enjoy, including the person that was hypnotized instead of trauma. Mm. What oh, the? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, on to the next one. See, I told you I'd get steamed. Um, affirm that empathy is healthy. There have been many times in my life personally where people have made fun of me, have ridiculed me, have excluded me, have ghosted me because I'm empathic. And so I'm saying, don't be one of those people. Make it something that's healthy and treat other people in a healthy way when they're experiencing their empathy. Don't tell your child that, they, that you're embarrassing them. Or, the, pardon me, that they're embarrassing you. That's unhealthy. So if your child is sitting at a hockey game and is crying because maybe their brother who's a hockey player has been punched and his nose is bleeding and she's crying because her brother's nose is bleeding, mm. don't make fun of them. Or dismiss it. D- yeah, don't be dismissive. Don't say, Gee, you're, that's an embarrassment. Oh, he'll be fine. No, he has a bleeding nose. It might be broken. He may be in pain. 
Don't dismiss. Talk about the healthiness of being empathic. Keep going. We good with this? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I wrote down sort of like an addition to this debunk, and I'm not sure if that's the right word, Kelly, but debunk the people who make fun of empathy. Set boundaries. Teach your children that it's okay to be empathic. You're not a sissy. You're not a suck. If somebody calls you that, make sure that you say to your child, no, you're not. So debunk the labels is what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make sure that your child has the ability to set a boundary Mm -hmm. and to be able to say to the person, I reject or I I do not accept your comments Mm -hmm. or your judgment of me. Mm -hmm. No. Give them the strength. Give them the vocabulary. Give them the process. Give them everything that they need, the support, so that when they walk in the door and tell you that story, you make sure that they're healthy in it. Mm -hmm. Did you set a boundary? Good for you. Could you the next time if you did not? What would that look like? Let's practice it together. You could set it up. Okay. So maybe, 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 you know, the two parents get into a situation and role play it for them and show them some options. Maybe they let them practice six or seven times or even over weeks or months. It's important because the more practice they have at it, the more confidence they're going to have to use their empathy in the future. Without you. Yes. And I said parents, so I also want to note many people are single parents and that I just want to replace that with parent and child or siblings or grandparents or friends, anyone else as an option. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything with that one, Kelly? No. Okay. Oh, I really like this one. I wrote down, stop the behavior where no empathy allows them to be a bully. Isn't that awesome? I think you have to actually go into the example of when they're actually doing it and catching them. Mm -hmm. And stopping the behavior, but also explaining that there's a lack of feeling for another person when you're bullying someone. Mm -hmm. So So that they understand that as a child, because I think so many adults don't even put their head there ever. So can you stop and give us an example of what it means or what you, what you mean by stopping the behavior um, that is lacking empathy? Cause I'm just, I want to clarify for listeners, are you stopping the behavior as it's happening instead of educating after the behavior is over? Mm-hmm. So can, can you just illustrate an example for us? Oh, I saw a group of little boys in the grocery store with their mom, and one of them was sitting in the grocery cart, and he, every time one brother would go by, he'd kick him, kick him, kick him. And the mom saw it. He was only doing it to one brother, not the third. And the mom saw it and just told the little boy that was old enough to be doing the walking but was getting kicked just to get out of the way. Mm. Okay. So she just said, well, for God's sakes, just don't stand near him. Like she blamed him. Mm-hmm. Oh, women, just don't get raped. Right. Right. Thank you. What a great example to go with something like that, Kelly, for mm-hmm. people to understand the link between how we go from one place we think is not so important to a bigger place that becomes so very important we still have the same behavior or belief about it, right? Mm -hmm. So the mom addresses the boy to say, well, you get out of the way. You're the one that's the problem. You're in the way. He wasn't in the way in the least. Any other adult around could see that. And the little boy says to his mother, I'm not in the way, mom. I wasn't doing anything. Like he even Mm -hmm. tried to explain it to her and she went at him. And so the little boy in the, in the grocery cart that's kicking his brother keeps swinging his legs. Well, and the parent probably knows that I can pick on the 
calmer kid because he won't cause a scene. If I tell the poor behaved kid to stop, he's going to raise hell. Yeah, and I'm and I'm trying to point out that situation because that's a bullying situation. The little boy in the cart would have been around four years old. He's bullying his older brother, and he just got away with it. Oh, it's a twofold. Now the mom's bullying the same kid. That's right. So now we've got two bullies. So the kid in the cart is role modeling or modeling after his mom now. Mm-hmm. So I'm and both have no empathy. Mm-hmm. The mother has no empathy doesn't want to deal with anything. So she shut hers down and the little boy in the cart is going to model that. And the other little boy hopefully will get through life with some tools. Mm -hmm. So if we take that and make that a better situation, that mom would not have addressed the boy who was being bullied she would have dealt with the four-year-old one-on-one about his behavior, appropriately to the four-year-old, to say things like, how does that make your brother feel when you're kicking? Have you been kicked in the past? Do you know what that feels like? So when we ask the right questions, we actually can have a longer effect. So now if she succeeds in creating that empathy, that little boy in the car, sitting in the grocery cart probably will never do it again if she does it right. Mm-hmm. But if she doesn't bother, then guess how often that little boy is going to hurt his older brother? Or anyone. Yeah. And she will always have to defend him until a school system or a police system yeah. or a boss or a bigger kid is going to teach him the lesson. So she's setting him up for a painful situation. Yeah, of not understanding consequences. And not understanding why he's all of a sudden having them, why are the police doing this? Why is the school treating me this way? He really will not understand it and feel he's the victim. So when we don't have empathy being taught, we can have people who believe that they're the victim of something they're not. Mm -hmm. It's so worth it. I love doing this show. I'm so glad that you were happy to do this with me. I I want to say to you, um, for our non-patron listeners, uh, I think you're really lucky today that Karen chose to do this show on Coffee with the Sarlos. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying you should be ever ever so grateful. I'm just saying I think that you are very lucky because this material, as anyone in Patreon knows, could have easily been busted up into five shows. It normally would be. Yeah, and would be something that you access by being in one of the tiers. Right. And you are getting this for free. Yes. You should buy a book, I will say that, but didn't have to to have this show today. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next one is that empathy is a part of listening skills. Teach them to listen. You have to be a good listener, though. Right. And I think about those kids at the grocery store again, that if she had said to the four year old, or I don't know, he could have been five, whatever. But if she had actually said, do you hear what your brother is saying? Because his brother was actually saying things to him. Mm -hmm. He was actually asking him questions. The older boy was saying, why are you kicking me? Why do you, why do you want to hurt me? Mm -hmm. He was asking his brother fabulous questions to connect. He was trying to create empathy with his brother and the mom shot the whole thing to shit. She just came in and bombed the whole show. Mm -hmm. So you had a little boy around nine years old with good empathy skills, good good communication skills, and mom was shitting all over them. So teach them to listen. And as you said earlier, Teach them to ask better questions. And the way you do that is by asking the questions yourself. And listening to the answer. Some people ask questions and can ask good questions, but don't actually wait to listen. Wait to hear it. Well, I remember doing that. I had so much anxiety and so much people-pleasing. I did things like that in my past. I understand that. Mm -hmm. And I understand from having been there, that you can stop that pattern and that you can change it and create healthier patterns. 
-hmm. And that some people think, oh my God, that's so much work. No. Yeah. Well, I will say that it's work, but it is so valuable, so rewarding. Your anxiety decreases, your depression does, your social anxiety does. It, it's, it's, the value of it is incredible. And it's short term. Like you think about the effort it takes to break a pattern. Yeah, it takes time. But you, you then have those tools to continue on fairly effortlessly through life yes. because they're just innate. Yes. Once then, you learn how to control a hammer, you know, it takes a couple of times to practice, but afterwards, you know how to use a hammer in all general situations. Right. I, perfect. Um, I wrote down for the people who have children that are very empathic to chart it. Um, write it out. And so these, this would be for older kids. So say, say maybe around eight or nine or I don't know, whatever age. You can use charts. So I know that some people have the smiley face charts for emotions, age appropriate again. Um, but as they age and can write things down, I would encourage them to journal stuff like that. What in particular? Um, well, to journal when their emp empathy is something that they're being challenged with, what tools they used, like teach them to chart. Okay. I'm, I'm personally confused. So I'm just asking for listeners, am I charting or am I journaling? And what <gasps> am I charting and journaling? Okay. I like this. So you can ask them to journal. So let's go with journaling first. Okay. So it just be, I'm thinking about a couple of moms I've just done sessions with recently where we had sessions like a year ago and their children who are empathic are at different ages. So some of them have been doing journaling. She has a daughter that's been journaling her empathy. So she's taught, she writes down when she feels empathic for somebody. She writes down the little experience and then her and her mom talk about it. So it's, it's used as a tool. So, so she writes out how she feels, what she thinks about it, what her solutions are. There's a little process that goes with the journaling. Then she has a sibling who doesn't like the journaling. She doesn't like all the writing. So she does it in a chart form where she'll say, um, she'll put things in the chart. Now, do you mean specifically what goes into that little girl's chart, Kelly? Well, I also mean what situations are these like that are happening for these kids to gravitate to the journal or the chart. Like if my if I'm a teenager, if I'm 13 and you've got your first boyfriend that you're holding hands with, I'm dating myself because I was so, such a square. Um, but like if my girlfriend just got broken up with and I feel sad for her today, am I going to my journal to say my heart felt broken for my girlfriend today? Um, she got dumped. Uh, I can't imagine yes. how her heart feels or her, how much she wants to cry. And then there's a question in the chart, what action can I take? So then under that, she might write down um, checking in with her girlfriend, what she needs. Okay. That, that's what I'm talking about. So that parents are like, well, do they just journal everything they feel? Like when, when is it that I'm supposed to say, and do you want to pull out your journal for that? Because this is directed at the parents to know when to pull these tools out for your kids. Right. So you could journal if you're being empathic by watching something on TV. So you might watch a particular show and know that there's stuff in it where they can connect to somebody. So, Oh, I have another example for you in a minute, where then you sit down afterwards during dinner and you ask questions and then I'll say questions around, so which character did you feel empathy for? Who did you feel for in this show? And so you might, if you have a couple of children or even just one in yourself, they might say, oh, I felt, uh, you know, empathy I felt for, I, I could really feel this person's pain when he broke up with her. Or, um, and what would that be like? Can you imagine that? So tell me what that would be like if you imagined it. Hmm. What choices could you have around that when you, when you feel that? What action could you take to feel better? What action could you take for that person to help them? Is there a boundary around that? Cool. So you can ask a variety of questions. And now I can't remember what else I was going to tell you. That's fine. I think that was a good example. Yeah? Cool. It had something to do with the teacher creating that kind of a process in the school system 
where some of the schools, where there's bullying, they actually have a page where they actually write those questions. How did this, do you think this made this person feel? Mm-hmm. Um, what action or what choices could you see that you could have done instead of this? Mm-hmm. What choices could this person do in this situation? Which one could you imagine yourself doing? This sounds like a good detention sheet. Oh, maybe it is. Maybe it is exactly a good detention sheet. Mm-hmm. Uh, what? Uh, anyway, I'll stop with that. Mm-hmm. So maybe the detention sheet is something that could be shared with parents to actually be doing at home as well. Okay. So another another one to create another point to create empathy is to have a pet and have your child care for the pet. Have them empathize. So say they're teasing the pet. And the pet is snapping. Maybe the cat or the dog is... Um, Expressing irritation. Yes. Or um, I'll say in a negative way. And then the parents have to come in and say... Does anyone express irritation in a good, healthy way? Well, I think dogs walk away sometimes. Okay. I think oh, okay. of Parker. Parker doesn't... He just walks away. Sorry, I was thinking irritation just not being... A good thing, but yes, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, Parker's perfect because he he Parker really is perfect. <laughs> Go on. Yeah. Well, when he when someone irritates him, he doesn't snap at them. He yeah. walks away from them. He puts himself into his own timeout, mm-hmm. and he's done that since he was a puppy. And we had his crate. He would just walk into the crate whenever he wanted his own space because it was safe for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm thinking of that just as an example with a pet that. If your child is irritating your pet and the pet is responding and is snapping and it could escalate to a bite, then the parent has the choice to come in and not discipline the dog. Well, maybe a a dog owner would say yes, but I don't know. I'm thinking about the parent coming in and saying to the child, this dog could be in a lot of trouble if someone else did this to it out in public, and he bit them as a response of being frustrated. How do you want to change, or how would you like to change your behavior and how you show affection or play with your pet that doesn't have to include irritating him? What, what happiness do you get out of irritating the dog? And I think that's, that's a really key question because I see a lot of humans who love irritating other people. They think it's funny, and that's a lack of empathy. So I think that's something that should be caught at a very young age, that if you see your child enjoying irritating another person, that or your spouse is doing it, that you deal with a lack of empathy. Good. That you have to be able to confront your partner, a parent, anybody. You may have a grandparent that loves to irritate your child until they cry. Right? Why are you writing me? Oh, sorry. Like, is that my experience? No. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, all these situations are possible. There's fucking teachers that do it. Right. Oh, that's sad. It's people. Any dynamic that you put a person in, they can express these unhealthy behaviors, no matter what the roles are. Right. And this this is where a lack of empathy is abuse. Yeah, across the board. Right. And this is where I'm trying to say it is this important that we learn it, keep it, nurture it, maintain it. Don't don't get a pet to teach it, <laughs> to teach your kid empathy. No, <laughs> but the I'm... If pet exists in the home, great. <laughs> right. But I'm just saying it's yeah. a wonderful way to teach healthy boundaries, mm-hmm. respect, and the value of what empathy gives us as human beings towards each other, and towards pets. I know. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to illustrate again that I know that that's what you're saying. Yeah. I'm saying it for the Pool A listeners who are like, oh, I'll get my kid a pet. Right. That is not where we're starting from. No. We're saying if there is a pet, there is a good opportunity in there to teach empathy. Yes. It's not the solution. Right. Because a lot of people want the quick solutions. Okay. Yeah, sadly. Okay. I'm almost at the end. 
teach your child to assess their own needs and their own wants and to know the difference between a want and a need. I, I need ice cream. No, you want it. It's not a need. Some, I need food. Yes, maybe you do need food. But the type of food, if it's not healthy, is a want. Healthy food is a need. So make sure that your children understand the difference between a want and a need so that empathically they can understand what other person's wants are versus what their actual needs are. Mm -hmm. You meet a person's needs. You deliberate over whether you want to participate in meeting a want. Good. That's very concise. (laughs) I feel really proud of myself. Good. (laughs) Okay. Show them that there are choices. I've brought this up several times, but I'm still going to bring it up as one of the points because it's one of the things that empathy does is it allows us to see choice. It gives us healthy choices. Mm -hmm. When we don't have empathy, it's sometimes more challenging to see healthy choices. I don't want to rule out and say you can never find them. Mm -hmm. I I want to give some people the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to do a little recap for people whose children are highly empathic because I tried to put all of the show together today for anybody listening, Mm -hmm. no matter what level they're at or what level their children are at, so that you had things for beginners right through to higher levels. But then we truly have people who are really highly empathic. Mm -hmm. They're feeling world events. Their children are waking up with nightmares about climate change. And I don't mean just because they're hearing it in the news. I mean because empathically they're feeling the earthquake. They're feeling things at higher levels. You good with this one? Yeah, and I'll add to you because I'm I'm sure there are some who won't understand that example at all. Okay. Um, but perhaps they are hearing in the news about the devastation of the animals because of the client the climate change. Right. And the empathy that they feel for animals may be the thing that's calling causing them distress. Yeah. So I'm going to go through because we've done all of that. I'm going to go through a short list that I wrote for for these people. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to wait for your comments, if you're good with that, Kelly, because I don't know if it's like a, whole, to hold off? a whole other show. Oh, I don't know. Do what you want. So for, for higher levels of empaths, I wrote things down like, make sure that they're talking about what they're going through, about their empathy. Don't let them all bottle it in. Make sure that they get time for rest. And if you're this child... Make sure you get rest. So you might come home from school and you can't go straight out to start shoveling for your parents. You need to have a nap. Then you can go out and do your chores. And rest does not always mean sleep. Rest can just be a form of gentleness that that individual enjoys. Yeah. I I remember at times in my life that when I rested, certain people thought that I was being lazy. They thought that I was avoiding things instead of resting. So it was like if they came home from work and I hadn't done everything, they thought I was lazy. Okay, well then let's frame this differently for these new age people. If your kid comes home on 6% battery, Mm. they're in the red, right? And we now know that we need to search for a charger. The rest at least gets them up to their 25% where they're not on low battery. Good. Everyone gets the technology and panics that we're yeah. dying. We have to find the charger. We yeah. need to plug in. That's what rest is meant to be. Oh, And you do, you have to understand like that. that some people come home wired. Some children come home wired from school, but that actually is their 6%. That's right. And they their rest can look different than ours. Yeah. So if my rest is to actually lay on the treatment table and have a nap, that might not look the same for you. It can mean coloring. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I wrote down that empaths, people who are highly empathic, need alone time. So if your child is coming home from school and has had a full day with other people and they have siblings, they may need their alone time just at the kitchen table, or they may need their alone time in their bedroom or on the couch or with their pet. 
And other people need to understand when they come home after their practice or whatever, that this is their alone time. And this is something that the individual gets to take and ask for. It is not a punishment. That's right. So if they're saying, you know, I'm not in a good place or I need my alone time, you're not saying, then go to your room. Mm -hmm. This is not a punishment. This is something they ask for so that they can recharge. Oh, Andrew did that yesterday when he came back from work and he said, we were just sitting waiting for you for supper. And he said, I'm not in a good place. Um, I had asked him if he would download some fun music with me for my workout and uh, if he wanted to see my new painting. And he said, um, not right now. I need, I need my downtime, my alone time. And he says, it's not about you. It's about what occurred at work with customers. I'd like to be able to look at your painting and say appropriately what you deserve to hear having done a beautiful piece of work. And I'm not there. I can't say it to you yet. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, what do you need in your alone time? Would you, do you need the room? Do you want me to go down into the basement? Do you need the floor of the house? What do you need? No, he says, I'd like you to still be in the living room. I want to hang out with you, but I just need to clear my head for a bit. Do you mind if I just listen to some music with my headphones on, but be around you? I want to be with you. Sure. So then I just sat. I enjoyed my alone time beside him while he enjoyed his alone time. Okay. Um, I wrote down right, and we went over that. Um, I wrote down nature, which we haven't brought up too much yet, or I don't think at all. So some highly empathic people really release and let go um, the stress around being empathic through nature. Mm-hmm. And and I didn't write this on the page, but I want to add it. Exercise. Highly empathic people need, I'll say, frequent exercise. Movement. Yes. Mm-hmm. So instead, it might be shaking your leg. It might be. And so if a student is, sits at school and twiddles their, their pen in their hand, or they shake their leg, or they whatever, shake, um, that can be their way of releasing their their energy and balancing themselves again. And I think sometimes someone might see that and go, stop that, and think it's a bad behavior instead of asking the question, is there quietly, privately, not in front of 30 other students, what does that do for you? I notice that you you shake your pencil or you, you do something. Um, what does that do for you? Because the child might say, oh, it calms me down. Oh, it, it's just that when I get anxious, if I do that, it calm, it, you know, I feel better. Or I can focus when I do this. So if you ask the question, then it's not becoming something that they think is worth a punishment or being called out for or embarrassed in front of other people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, Sorry. I have two more. Boundaries. Highly empathic people have to have fantastic freaking boundaries. They have to be able to say no. They have to know when they're being overstimulated. They might have to say after school, I can't go to grandma's and be around 50 or 13 people. Or if I do, I'd like to go there and sit in the basement by myself, but not be punished for it. He's being antisocial. What's wrong with him? Doesn't he like us? No, maybe he wants to be in the house like Andrew maybe even in the same room or on the same floor or just in the same place, but not be part of something, but still be very content and happy to be there. Mm -hmm. And I wrote down, checking in, that empathic people need you to ask them good questions like, what do you need? What, As as in that example of, of doing a little thing of releasing energy, what does that do for you versus being made fun of? when people don't understand it. So they need more curiosity-based questions versus judgmental-based statements. I The only thing I wanted to add is, because um, I know you, you put down talk about it, is validate it. Oh, yeah. Because it, if we're talking specifically about mm-hmm. the people who have children who are highly empathic, if they're picking up on what we are feeling, if they are picking up on our emotions, then 
We have to be able to be honest about what we're feeling age appropriately and be able to validate when they say, mommy, are you sad? Mommy, are you upset? Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to deny them the validity or to understand that they are actually in tune with us, then you're just going to create more confusion and you're just going to create more fear. Right. And then you're not trustworthy. You are not a trustworthy parent. You're not a trustworthy partner Mm -hmm. or whatever it is you are in life. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that goes right through everywhere, unless it's at work or in your home and that person is narcissistic and is asking you for your emotions and you should not tell them because they use it against you. Yeah. Good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've got to stay safe. That's right. Empaths have to um, be very aware of their own energy and make sure that they don't put other people's needs before their own. That's what I, I would say a lot of it boils down to. So that you demand a level a level of respect from other people. Okay. And we're teaching parents how to be able to do that for their children. Yes. So that they can maintain their empathy and intuitiveness um, as they grow. That's right. Good. Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. Well, other than what we say at the end of every show, I know you're going to close with, please email us if you don't understand it, or if you have other ideas, or if you have questions. I know you're going to ask that, but I certainly would like to stress that to people Mm -hmm. because um, being empathic is a challenge. Mm -hmm. And every single human being is supposed to be empathic. We were supposed to all connect to each other. This narcissism is shit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So if you have questions or comments, you can email us at info at bysarlo.com. If you're listening from Patreon today, thank you so much for your financial and emotional support. If you're listening with the general public, no matter how you got here or where you're listening from or watching from, we're so very grateful. Um, If you can share, like, subscribe, um, send in your comments, anything you can do to interact with our audio and video helps us um, have a farther reach, and we very much appreciate that. Again, questions or comments to info at buysarlo.com, and have a great weekend.